And now for our speaker, uh, she's a California native from Santa Barbara and having grown up in Oakland, Laura Albers came to SLO in 2002 to raise her two children and put down some roots. She earned a BA in elementary education at Pepperdine and a master's in public administration for nonprofit management from USC. She has worked in almost every nonprofit that I've ever heard of in SLO uh, in some amazing positions. Uh, the most recent, she's the executive director for SLO Climate Coalition and here, is here to speak to us about the resources and actions available on the Central Coast to help you find your way to, cre to create resiliency around you, your life, and your community. Hey, Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Nancy. I, I'm always a little bit um, like shocked when I, I hear somebody reading a bio about me. I'm like, ooh, that sounds really cool. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but no, thank you for having me. And I recognize, I know we don't have cameras on all the, the people logging in, but I recognize a lot of names um, from some of my previous positions and, and all the overlap that we get in this county um, from those of us who keep doing the good things in the good places. So really happy to see, see some names. So um, thanks for having me. I'm gonna start uh, with just a little bit about Slow Climate Coalition. Um, which is who I'm representing now. And let me get my screen here shared. I think that looks good. All right. Um, and I'm gonna skip through this real quick because I wanna get more to the meat of this, which is talking about climate change and, and how much agency each of us actually have to combat it and to build some community resiliency. So, um, this is just a little bit about Slow Climate Coalition here, our vision and mission, the values that we apply to, to every consideration that we have as far as when we're going to, to uh, approach anything. Um, and I won't read all of that because you all might be able to, um, but our vision really is a vibrant, just and climate resilient central coast. So we're working towards carbon neutrality um, to get that, that climate resilient central coast. Um, one of the ways that we do that is through a lot of education. So uh, you can come and learn with us for, through several different types of <clears throat> programs that we have. And we, we kind of have separated these into everything from, from the small actions to big actions. And then we've got the civic actions in between. So our small actions are the things that we're actually going to talk uh, mostly about tonight. Um, and they're the things that are accessible to everybody. So, so everything from simply making sure that you've got LED light bulbs in your home um, to thinking about how you shop and what you eat and your, your waste um, chain, you know, how you deal with the things that you're done with. Um, those are those everyday actions. I want to point out, we do have a resource there. It's resilienceslow.org. Um, and it's, it, it, it will give you um, a ton of ideas on actions that you can take. We'll talk about some of them later, um, but it's a really fun tool to use. You can actually build an account on this platform if you'd like to. Um, you can upload your current state with with you know what what your energy bill is right now or what um, what actions you do take right now and. And then you can actually go and select things that you're going to do. So I'm going to do this, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to buy an electric vehicle this year. And, it, and it'll actually tell you um, your impact from each of those actions that you take. So it's a really cool to, tool. I invite you all to check that out. Um, we also have resiliency workshops, which um, I invite all of you to reach out to me after this and, and let me know if, if you'd like to talk about having them. Resiliency workshops are times when we can come in and facilitate conversations similar to the things we're going to talk about tonight. Um, but we'll come to you, we'll come to your group. So whether it's, you know, your book club, um, your service club, a nonprofit, your workplace, your neighborhood, um, any anywhere that there is a group of people that, that are gathering, um, we will come and we'll help facilitate discussions with that group around things that interest that specific group. 
um, with regards to, to climate action. So those are resiliency workshops. Please um, reach out to me after this if you're interested in learning more about those. They are offered free of charge. Um, and we have fantastic college core fellows through Cal Poly who are trained to help facilitate those. And the, the youth are really exciting um, to hear from and to have those conversations with. Anyway, so then we've got civic, civic actions, this policy, anything that's related to climate, um, we like to help people be informed about. Um, and then our big actions, and those are things like buying an electric vehicle or electrifying your home. Um, and we have a lot of, of support around that to help people learn about things, to help people access every rebate and incentive they could get um, and all that. The other way that we um, like to, to work towards our message is mission is just engaging folks. So um, there are a few things that we offer. We've got events and our website can tell you about that. We have teams like our activation team, um, advocacy team, events team. Um, and then our newsletter is a great place to stay in touch. We do not send out very many um, emails so you will not get bombarded if you choose to, to sign up for a newsletter. Um, we do once a month and then every now and then one or two, you know, a timely poignant notices throughout the month, but it's usually just that once a month. So, um, oh, did we miss, hold on a second. I don't think that we were ready for solutions yet. Let me see. Oh, it's in the wrong place. Okay, so I'm going to skip this slide for a second and come back to it because this got mixed up. So <laughs> climate change. Um, why would we even think about reducing carbon when we're talking about trying to, to mitigate climate change? Basically, because with Slow Climate Coalition, we want to focus on the biggest impact that we can and carbon emissions are the leading cause of, of climate change. They are also the things that we're most in control of. So um, with, with and, and there's a little bit there on climate change, if you don't know, I think with this group, most of you are kind of aware of what we mean by climate change, um, but there's a little bit more of a description there. If you need it, I can give it to you more later. We actually have a, a, a video of a, of a, um, a Zoom, presentation on climate change, kind of climate change 101, what it means. Um, and I can connect you to that if you need more. But essentially, if we can lower our carbon emissions, we're going to help to mitigate that carbon change, which means that we can extend the life and the quality of life here on our earth. So um, carbon footprint is another term that's almost interchangeable with with reducing carbon emissions. Greenhouse gases, same type of thing as carbon emissions. So these are all terms that get thrown around a lot. They essentially mean kind of the same thing. Um, so carbon footprints measures the amount of greenhouse gases that is emitted by a person, community, organization. And that's what we have our agency in, right? That's what we can, can have a little bit of uh, ability to change and make a difference in. So how we want to do that, we're going to get to these solutions now, and I skipped that slide earlier because I don't know why it was in the wrong space, um, but there are a few things we're going to talk about. The first thing is building resilient communities. So uh, a climate resilient community for our purposes, because I know the word resiliency can mean a lot of different things in different situations and contexts. So climate resilient community is one that can prepare for, respond to, and recover from the effects of climate change while continuing to thrive. So we're talking about things like heat waves or when we've got flowers or, well, if a lot of you were out on the coast when we had all the floods, um, the resiliency of that community to respond to that type of situation is what we're talking about here. Um, and part of it is, is decreasing the likelihood for these the, do you even need to, right? It's, it's the preventative measures. And the other is being ready to respond to that. And I will not read all of these, but these are just some of the ways that communities, as a community, this isn't necessarily the individual, but communities together can build resilience. Um, and, you know, some of it is at the, the public agency level, you know, infrastructure, that's your cities and counties and states and federal governments in, investing in things like um, 
you know, taking care of, of fire burn areas or um, making sure people have sandbags, you know, these are infrastructure things. Um, local food. So food is another thing with climate resiliency. Um, we have more and more food deserts as our climate continues to change. Um, and I think in our county, at least what we're seeing a lot, it, or maybe this is just where I work and it's my little bubble, but um, improving government involvement. So I'm aware of, of, you know, many of our municipalities here, whether it's the cities or um, maybe it's, it's uh, working groups and committees, but most of our government agencies here are really wanting more participation by, by people, by the people who live here. And that's really huge in being able to affect that change that we wanna see in our community. So these are just some of the things, the ways that communities can build resilience. And then there's household activities. So if you didn't know, yeah, 40% of our US emissions come from household activities. So that includes things like transportation, how we get around, right? Are you, are you driving a car? Are you walking? Are you riding the bus? Are you taking public transportation? If you're driving a car, what kind of drive car are you driving? If you're driving a car, are you, are you carpooling? If you're driving a car, are you combining trips so that you're not going out again and again and again for different things, right? Um, food, that's, that's uh, our carbon footprint is, is coming from both food that we eat, like the, what we choose to bring into us and agriculture and, and how things grow, um, but also our waste right? And how we dispose of our food. Um, and there's home energy and spending. Spending is like, you know, how we shop, right? Are we shopping local? Are we shopping fresh? Are we shopping things that, uh, you know, are we using our, are we shopping things that are shipped in a lot of packaging and over the, you know, miles and miles or across countries and seas and all that. So that's all the spending. Those are the things that individually we have the ability to to choose how we how we do life in these ways, um, and we can do that with the climate in our in our head. I mentioned earlier resilienceslow.org. This is just a screenshot of of the page. So would love for you all again to get on here because then you can get so many good ideas about what each of us um, has the ability to do and and resources for how to access certain things that would apply to to any of those action areas. These are the categories that will show up on resilientslow.org. So this is kind of how the site is, is organized. Um, and you can get you know, a few ideas about what might be in each of these categories. And I'm going to open it up to maybe some, some discussion here because what I'd love for us to do is to talk about what you all have seen, either in your own home, maybe it's something you're doing, maybe it's something a neighbor's doing, or in a workplace that's happening, or in, in the community, maybe your municipality has, has initiated a really cool climate action program that you really see. But this is how we build that community resiliency, is by not reinventing the wheel, but sharing what we already know. So I am gonna just stop sharing for a minute and I would love to, yes, open the floor to hear from people what kinds of things have you seen or are you doing, or maybe you would like to do, um, that build resiliency in your home or your community. Yeah, Laura, we've had some problems with um, Zoom bombers. So people can't chat. Uh, they'll just have to write it in the chat. And so we'll be looking for comments in the chat. Okay. 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 Good to know. And we'll wait for a chat, but please start throwing that in there. Um, I'll tell you one of the initiatives while, while people are typing here. Um, one of the initiatives that, that I took on, I, I moved to a, an apartment complex this summer and I'm in San Luis Obispo. And we have a, um, like one area that's, that's sectioned off for the dumpster for our, our trash waste. And then we've got a, another area on the other side of the um, parking lot 
that is um, for our recycling and our green waste. And I kept seeing so much like recycling, recyclable, con you know, materials in the in the dumpsters, and then I'd go out to the recycling bin in the green waste, and the, it like nobody knows what they're doing, you know. And there's trash in there. The green waste. I was doing so good at you know bringing my food scraps out, but then I go and look one day, and there's just you know plastic bottles and this, and that contaminates the whole thing, right? And it's just useless. Anyway, so I I got the flyers that the IWMA Integrated Waste Management um, puts out about how to recycle and what goes in, in recycling and, and food waste and trash. And I printed those out and I laminated them and I put them up on, on, on the various areas. And I've got on the, on the area that has the, the trash recycling, it says, I, I have one that says no trash here. <laughs> Do not put any trash in this area. Um, and I must say it's been getting a little bit better. So that's one resource that IWA has really great um, information. So um, Wendy, solar panels and a battery, that is great. Were you able to access any, um, any rebates or incentive for that battery? I'm, I'm interested, I know there, there isn't anything right now for the solar panels, but um, the reason that having the, the home battery is exceptional, that's one of our big action items that we talk about, um, is because with a battery, um, you're building your own resilience in, in your home, right? You've got battery backup. So if there's a power outage, guess what? You're okay. You know, you're probably going to be okay. Um, I just talked to somebody today who has his battery set to, um, so that his home is drawing from his battery during the peak time, right? The, the like four to nine, or I don't know, whatever it is. Um, so he never has to pay those peak rates because it'll just draw from the battery and then it's, it's charging during the rest of the time. So that's kind of fun. Um, vegetable garden and a warm, a warm bin. So fun. I love it. French drains and marsh for water retention and diversion. That's awesome. Okay. And then, oh, hi, Fela. Four to 500 gallon tanks that collect roof runoff and use that water for watering in the yard all summer and fall. That is fantastic. And if you're like me and have an apartment and you don't have the, the capacity to have huge tanks like that for outside, uh, a smaller action, but still good is keeping, I keep a bucket in my shower so I can take my shower runoff water and, and water my plants with that. So um, really, really good ideas here. Okay, solar panels and a heat pump. Okay, heat pumps, so you know, and there's two different types of heat pumps. There's a, there's a um, water heater heat pump, and then there's an HVAC system heat pump. Um, they are both huge right now, <laughs> and there are lots of incentives and rebates for those, and we have a program that can help walk you through that, that can help connect you to contractors, um, that can will will help you figure out which rebates and incentives you qualify for and make sure that you know how to get those. Um, but there is a lot of money right now from the Inflation Reduction Act and and more and other companies to to get that transition going, the home electrification and heat pumps are huge for that. So if you are interested in that and you want any assistance, um, again, please reach out to me. We have our eHome Assist program. Um, OK. And there's a question here. Can I talk about what really gets recycled in our blue cans? So we talk about this a lot. And I always say that I'm not the best person to talk about it because the IWMA and science discovery, that's like all they do. They're so good. And they're so, they're so informed about this and they'd be a great person to actually come in and talk to this group. Um, but it, they also have available, but, you know, constantly updated uh, information about what is recyclable. So some of the key points right now is when it comes to plastic, forget the numbers. Okay, I know we got trained to look at the little numbers and the little, you know, triangular arrow things, right? Number four plastic, number five plastic, number one plastic. Forget all the numbers right now. As far as plastic, what is recyclable is hard plastic. So a soft flimsy plastic bag is not recyclable. 
that unfortunately needs to be trashed if you can't find a way to, to reuse it. Um, but like a plastic container, like I had my, my cut up cantaloupe from the grocery store the other day, your plastic container of that, that is recyclable. Um, cans and jars are recyclable, even if they have mixed materials. And so those of us who maybe go through more peanut butter than we should, <laughs> we end up with a lot of pe empty peanut butter containers. Um, you don't have to wash it completely. You don't have to get every last bit of, of food out of there. Uh, a good rinse is, is plenty. Um, they do want you to put the lids back on and then put it in the, in the recycling bin. Another thing that people often think is recyclable, but is not. Any sort of container that has like a waxy finish on it. So like your milk cartons, the half gallon cartons, the gallons are recyclable, but those half got, or, you know, some of the juice comes in that those are not recyclable because they've had to be coated with a plastic so that it doesn't leak. And once that happens, the materials can't be separated. So those unfortunately need to go in the trash. Um, let's see what else. Oh, this is a fun one. So because we now have the biodigester, um, for all of our green waste, which by the way, they offer tours. And if you haven't ever gone on a tour of the biodigester, I highly recommend it. It's super fascinating. Um, but that biodigester can take our typical green waste, you know, our, our leaves, our cut grass, our dead flowers from our, you know, flower jars or whatnot. And it can take our food waste, but it also can take kind of any other organic material. So pizza boxes, this is always a big issue, right? Like what are we doing with our pizza boxes? It's all this cardboard, but then it had grease on it. And if it has grease on it, then a cardboard can't be recycled. So then we'd have to trash them. No more, you do not need to trash your um, cardboard pizza boxes anymore. Take the little plastic uh, table thing that, that holds the top up out and, and you can toss that. But the, the cardboard boxes now can go in the compost um, because the biodigester bio likes that. Um, same thing with like paper towels. If you've, you know, used a paper towel to clean up some sort of food item or whatnot, go ahead and put it in your, in your um, compost. Um, everybody in the county can have a free countertop bin. So you can contact your waste service provider. Um, if you don't have one yet, they will bring one out to you. And they're like this big. Mine doesn't stay on my countertop. It goes underneath my sink. But um, those are available to everybody. Um, and green waste bins also. So if you happen to live in a place that does not have a green, you, or you don't know where your green waste bin is, you can contact um, uh, your waste service provider and they can bring out a green bin for you. Um, Okay, what else? Any other questions on that? Yeah, Laura, the tech guru has enabled um, people to be able to chat with you if they raise their hand. Ooh. Um, that they that he can unmute them and then they can ask a question. So if you do have a question, go ahead and raise the hand and um, Bob will help you be able to chat. Thank goodness for our tech gurus, right? That's just fantastic. Okay, while we're waiting to see if anybody does have a question, I can also tell you that questions like that, um, what really gets recycled, those are, those are some of the topics that we can talk about in our resiliency workshops. So like uh, we've gone out to church groups, we've gone out to uh, mobile home parks, let's say we, I mean, we'll go anywhere, but you know, if people you wanna gather with are really interested in learning more about, you know, the waste, the waste uh, flow and what to do with, with certain things, 
we, we will come out and have those conversations and we cover not just things like what will actually go in your bins, but what are the other ways we can be good to our climate with our waste? And that's going to be things like, where can we reuse things? Where can we reduce what we need in the first place? Where can we recycle or upcycle? Um, last year we had a, our first upcycling competition and we invited people to come and compete and they took three hours in the library community room in San Luis Obispo and, and made things from other things. Um, and that was really fun. So, so again, those types of ideas do best with, with groups of people, right? So you've got a lot of people around um, that can give each other ideas and then each of our ideas gets better and bigger. Um, no questions though, huh? Okay, so I am going to share my screen again. Here we go. Okay, so on, I said that we like to learn a lot um, and we like to help people learn. One of the things that we have been um, uh, paying attention to, I will say, is the Offshore Wind Project. So we have a group of people that have put together these three webinars. We are, we are, we'll be coming up on our, our third one now. Um, the first one, and these are all recorded, and so, and, and they either are now or will be soon available on our website. Um, the first one was why we should even have offshore wind. Um, that really didn't talk about wind so much as it talked about climate change. So that's that's a good place to get some general information about what's happening right now in our climate, um, why climate change really is a thing, <laughs> um, and and what we what we need to do about it to change. Um, the last one that we just had was on this this current project here off Morro Bay. What is the process of that? So where are we right now in the process? Um, how, do, how do people provide input on that process? What's the timeline for each step? These projects take a, a really long time and there's a lot of, of input that goes into things. So learning about that um, is helpful if you want to, to know more about it or, or have a say in what's going on. Um, and then the next one, that we're having coming up here October 30th is, is facts on the things that most of us are concerned about, or at least we hear most of the concerns about, um, you know, the, the marine life, right? Like if we have this offshore wind project, is it going to affect marine life? Is it going to affect animals? Is it going to affect the, the, you know, fishes and ability for, for, um, uh, What's the name of somebody who fit a fish or a fit? I'm totally blanking on the word. Somebody who fishes, is this going to be able to affect, is it going to affect their, their livelihood and ability to have, you know, uh, 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 fishing every day still? Um, acoustics, all that. The cost, what is the cost of this? And who's going to pay for that? And where's the money coming from? Um, all of those kinds of things that that most of us, you know, start to think about when we we consider a project like this. Those are the facts that are going to be there. Um, I don't find too many, I don't know if I've ever found anybody saying they're against wind energy. Um, it's more a discussion of where and when and how that, that wind energy would occur, right? So those are kind of the, the facts. So those are, those are webinars that we have. Um, I invite you all to attend um, our next one coming up there. And then we also have climate action gatherings. So we had we had stopped for the summer. We stopped for the summer. We just started it up again this month in October. They are always the second Thursdays of the month. Um, we have shifted them to the library community room uh, in downtown Slow. We used to have them on, on Thursdays and kind of competed with farmer's market. So now we're trying out doing it a little bit earlier in the night. Um, and at, at the library so that 
if folks wanted to, they could come to the climate action gathering and still have time to go hit up farmer's market um, before they go home. We have themes every month and for November in honor of the, uh, the time at the end of, towards the end of the month when most people eat a lot of food, <laughs> um, our theme is carbon smart food. So talking about, um, we'll be talking about and focusing on on the choices we make in, in what we eat and how we can make choices that um, are just a little bit a little bit better for the climate and for our environment. So I encourage you to come to those. Um, and then these are all QR codes, but you could also just go to our website and find out more about learning uh, all of these, these programs that we have. Um, we just finished up with an easy showcase and that was really fun. Um, engage with us and, and get involved. You can support us if you'd like. Um, but that's mostly what I have. And I would love to go back to, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I would love to go back to some, any more questions that have come in since then. Um, so let's see, I've got one here. From Larry Owens, greener electric supply is absolutely key to lowering CO2, but our community seems stuck on opposing both offshore wind and battery energy story. NIMBY, what say you? So yeah, so what I say to that is we need to just keep getting more informed, right? This is why we've we've tried to put together, you put a lot of time, well, I didn't, I can't take any credit for those webinars, but um, we've got a good group of people that are putting a lot of time into building those out so that we can be more informed. Um, and I think as far as all of us, uh, when we, when we hear opposition to things really trying to follow up with somebody saying, okay, you know, where, where's that information coming from? What are these concerns following up? And because it can get really confusing and it can get complicated. And again, like I said, most I haven't heard anybody oppose wind energy at all. It's the, it's the, well, do we want to do it here? And battery energy storage, is this going to be something that, uh, you know, has the likelihood to, to cause risk to people? You know, these are the things that people are concerned with. So we need to keep getting engaged with it. So, so things like tuning into webinars like the ones we've done. Other people have done some as well. we'll we continue to cross promote what everybody else is doing um, along the same same lines, right? With the same mission or aligned aligned mission, I should say, as, as we have. Um, and I think that's all we can do is just keep learning more and keep helping other people learn more. Any other questions? Laura, this is Nance again. Do you have um, a feeling about TerraCycle? I do not. So, so they take a lot of the plastics that, uh, you know, aren't the numbered ones. So they'll take plastic bags and things like that. Do you know anything about them? Not really. I mean, I've heard of them, but I don't, I don't know anything about them. Um, citizens Climate Education slow county citizens climate education they have a new plastics program and a plastics talk it might be uh, on video too um but i know that they have been focusing on plastics a lot this last year so they might know more about that um and here i'll maybe oh can i pop this in there i don't know if i can meeting group chat there we go okay And that is, um, I think their website is slowcce.org. They just changed it. Okay. Um, Eight billion trees earlier. What can you tell me about that program? I absolutely cannot tell you anything about that program. Um, <laughs> we used their graphic that we really liked and that was from either their website or some other program that we were doing from them, but I can't really tell much. Um, I, I don't know much about them. Uh, Fela uses TerraCycle for fabric and old clothing that can't go to Goodwill. Very good deal. Oh, 
Okay, that's really cool. So fabric, this is another area that, that we're really active in um, is thinking about our, our clothing and, and what we wear. And even if it's not the fast fashion, which is you know the really cheap from China stuff that you're gonna wear for a year and then toss, um, we all still have so many new clothes that we really don't need. And we have so many options here for recycling, reusing, regifting. We really love thinking about the circular economy. So from things like the Facebook groups, like Buy Nothing, they were the Buy Nothing groups, which I just love. I've given away so many clothes through through that site. And, um, you know, just being able to say, hey, don't, if I don't need this, you know, the best thing is if it's still in use, right? Let's keep it still in use. Um, and then getting ideas from other people about the upcycling. Like I said, you know, you can you can make new clothes. Maybe you've got something that's just old and and funky and you don't really like it anymore. Well, you could you could do something new to it. You could change the sleeves out with a different, you know, another another piece of apparel. Uh, you could put a patch on. You can screen print it. Um, any of those those ideas. Um, the Goodwill bins are awesome. Um, so that's here in slow. And those are the bins before it gets to the store. And it's really inexpensive. And there's just piles of clothes. And you do have to kind of pick through them, which, which can be painstaking. But um, I have found amazing things in there and, and really inexpensive, which is great. Okay, what, oh, and here, okay, so here's another thing too that we've been doing lately um, along the lines of, of, of the, the apparel. Um, most of our organizations or workplaces might have some sort of branded apparel, right? We've got shirts or sweatshirts or hats with our, our company logos on them, right? So we needed something like that um, two years ago. We, had, we hadn't had any really made with Slow Climate Coalition. We started out as Slow Clean Energy um, years ago and, and we hadn't made any shirts or apparel since then. So the thing is, when you're, when you're ordering printed shirts, you know, it's hard to, well, most of the apparel that you're ordering um, is not coming from here local, at least, you know, your, hopefully your shirt printer is, but you know, they're ordering from somewhere else, um, often overseas. Um, and, and then you have to deal with getting, you know, how many of each size do you want and each color do you want? And you're, you rarely end up with just the right amount, right? And so whatever you're ordering, you end up with too much of something or too little of something else. So what we started doing is we would get our, our graphic that we wanted printed, um, whether it was, you know, some artwork for a particular event, like we always do a special Earth Day um, uh, graphic that that our College Corps fellows get to, to design, um, or just your regular logo. And we have a silk screen made of that. And then we have a silk screen printing event where whether it's like, we just did this with our College Corps Fellows. We've got a new group of College Corps Fellows this year. We had one, uh, an event with them, or it could be just anybody in the community. We do do this at, at Earth Day events as well. But you bring the screen and you bring some ink and people can bring whatever they want to have the image printed on. So this way you're not buying anything new. People are getting exactly what they want because they're bringing the thing that they want it on. And you can just keep reusing the screen. It's much less expensive <laughs> than having to order, you know, a big run of, of, of printed apparel or whatnot. And um, people really love it. It's really fun. Everyone is unique um, because it's not, you know, mass printed. So some will be a little bit crooked or some won't be, you know, quite perfectly printed, but they're all just super fun. And we've, we've been embracing that for the last couple of years. And I like to share that with folks because um, it's kind of a fun idea, whether, whether it's, yeah, for your organization or, you know, a kid's soccer team or something, just you, you can go to, to the local printers and, and ask them, uh, if they'll, if they'll burn a screen for you and then you've got the screen and you can use it 
you know, in perpetuity, really. Any other questions? Okay, so if there's no other questions, then before I really wrap it up, I would love to offer the opportunity for you all to throw something in the chat. So when we finish our resiliency workshops, every single one that we do, um, we always end with, with an invitation to say one climate action that the meeting has inspired each person to take. So it might be something that, you know, you just heard is like, oh yeah, worm bins, that's right. I was gonna go figure out how to get a worm bin. Um, or yeah, I've been meaning to look into battery storage and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that finally this week. Um, but it we find that it's much more powerful to do this in groups because then you've got a little bit of accountability, even if people aren't um necessarily uh you know, keep holding people accountable, right? It's like it, nobody's going to be policing anybody, but stating something publicly and with other people having eyes on it can really help. Um, it can help each of us go, okay, wait, I am going to do that now. So um, I would love to encourage any of you who have an interest now to pop in the chat something that you can commit to doing in the next month, we'll say within the next month, some sort of action you can take that will help the climate in some way. So great, Wendy started one, Wendy said, I'm going to go through my clothes and pick out the ones I don't wear anymore, but are in good condition, donate them to Achievement House. Excellent, excellent means not worry as much about the numbers on the plastics. Yeah, forget the numbers. Is it hard or not? If it's hard, put it in that bin. And work towards buying an electric vehicle. Yeah, so Joanne, um, here's a EVs. Hold on, I'm gonna put this in here. EVs for everyone is a... Um, is a site that can help you identify rebates and incentives. But you can also reach out to us directly, Slow Climate Coalition, and we will um, help you help you with that. Uh, as far as finding cars and what you might want to look for and all of that. Um, was there a hand up? Uh, yeah, Susie Reddy had her hand up for a quick second. I don't know if that was a mistake or not. We were testing the function. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And buy peanut butter in bigger jars. Yeah. <laughs> I do buy the biggest jar possible. I'm a peanut butter fanatic. I think I just live off peanut butter. Um, but yeah, buying things in, in bigger, bigger quantities, right? Limiting, limiting the amount of packaging that you can, that you need. Um, maybe one day we'll get, more stores around that you can use refill at, you know, but, but going to like, you know, the food co-op or, you know, other community markets that, that you can bring your own containers to refill your oats or your flour or your rice, um, that can help as well. What else? Any other commitments anybody wants to make? Gail, I want to check out the biodigester. Yes, it kind of helps. I think it helps you get excited about like paying attention to your food and green waste. <laughs> um, eggs in cardboard containers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, anytime we can avoid plastic, the better in general. Yeah. Um, and especially like when, when I'm looking for juice or milk, if I can find something in the, the hard plastic containers versus that, that kind of I was talking about before, that's kind of the paper that's that got the waxy finish. 
Um, I'll do the hard plastic even there because at least that's recyclable. Anything else? Okay, well, I can turn it back over. Um, oh, own container. Oh yeah, take my own container to restaurants for leftovers. That is fantastic. And I also highly suggest carrying around, and I always have uh, a utensil kit with me, no matter where I go. This is a bigger one I have in my backpack, but I've got a little one for my purse too. And you can find, you know, whatever kind you want. This one has metal silverware, a couple different straws of different sizes. Um, but it's really nice to be able to just skip those plastic, you know, forks and napkins, that kind of stuff. Um, also coffee cups, really great to try to get in the habit of always having an empty kind of to go cup with you so that if you stop at a coffee shop somewhere, you can skip the cups and just give them your reusable. Okay, I think that's good though, Bob, yeah? Yeah, Laura, it was fantastic, okay. thank you. Um, Bob's here too, I'm sure he's okay. shaking his head, yes. Um, I wasn't sure who was talking again, yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this is so important and um, all of us can do something, right? And if it's not us, then who? And so we're as responsible as anybody and it takes you know, just some small steps like buying eggs in a cardboard container or milk in a glass jar or, you know, it's it's small steps that make a big difference. And we all have to start somewhere. And it is our planet. You know, what are we leaving for future generations? So thank you so much for all of your ideas. Uh, there's a lot to do, but you have to start somewhere. <laughs>